Hello and welcome to another episode of A Brother's Creed Podcast. We're talking about motivation, experiences, and exploring the world around us. We're the Thomas Brothers, and I'm Ethan. I'm Jared, and today we're interviewing an entrepreneur, Neil Park, and he is out of California. He is an entrepreneur, and he's actually started a franchise that is a cleaning business called Made This. He is the CEO of this company, which is the first ever U.S.-based cleaning franchise service. Uh, We kind of run through his business, talk about that. He actually does it in a model where he's able to work abroad, uh, and it's uh, kind of a remote business for him. So it's really interesting uh, how he does his business and how he manages his time and and his team across the world because he's, you know, in some places he lived, he's lived in Colombia and different places around the world, and he's still operating his business in the U.S. So pretty cool guy, uh, very interesting, love talking to him. Uh, Let's uh, go ahead and dive into the interview. All right, let's do it. You can't climb the ladder of success with your hands in the pocket. We will not go quietly into the night. They tell me you're a man with true grit. I am the one who knocks. Don't ever tell me what I can't do, ever! That's how winning is done. All right. Uh, today we are here with Neil Perek. Neil, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Excited to be here, guys. Yeah. So Neil is the CEO of Made This Franchise um, and businessman, entrepreneur. We are so excited to get together with you to talk, learn from you and uh, talk kind of some strategies, some life strategies, business strategies and where we can all and also, progress. Yeah. And also hear some of your experiences about uh, living abroad and and working remotely yeah, during COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, which which is taking a, a different turn during COVID. I'm hoping to go back to it. So I'm excited to chat about that too. Cool. Well, maybe let's yeah. get started about, uh, I, I've listened to some of your stuff, some of your history about how you got started. Maybe you could talk to our listeners about, you know, how, what's, your, what's your history like and how you got into the business of what you're doing now, which is a uh, cleaning services type of stuff and, and franchising that business. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I guess I'll start from the top. I mean, I used to work in venture capital for a while, yeah. right out of college. So I was there for about four years. About halfway through that, I thought, you know, I got to, uh, it always stuck with me to have some sort of um, side income. Yeah. I don't know why I never felt secure with a normal job. Uh, so I thought, hey, I need some side income. It's going to be some side hustle. And I was trying a bunch of different things. And have you guys been on Reddit before? Yep. yep. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, but I was I was always on Reddit uh, when I should have been working, and uh, you know thinking about different business ideas. So I was trying anything which would allow me to work remotely, right? Yeah. Uh, e-commerce, drop shipping, like anything that's possible to do remote. Uh, I came across a post of a guy who was like, "Hey, I've started a cleaning company. Here's like the 20 steps I did to start it." And I thought, you know, what the heck? I'm doing a bunch of other stuff. Let me give this a shot as well. Then I started working, and this was like 2013, right when vacation rentals started to really become a thing. And that was back in the day of like early Airbnb when you would, people would kind of like hack it. Like they mm-hmm. lease a place, sublease it, and then just kind of keep renting it out as kind of in its infancy. Yeah. So right when I started is when people would said, Hey, can you guys do Airbnb cleanings? And uh, I didn't, at first I didn't know what we were doing. So, you know, we didn't have really guidance. I was just like, I just want to make money. I don't really know how to do this. Yeah. Um, so at first I said no, then looked into it more and realized that it's such a great niche that hasn't really been tackled. So why would you say, no? why, why love- would you say no? I'm curious. Why, why would you say no to someone offering you like, come clean my Airbnb, my house for like, why, why would you say no to that? Curious. Yeah. Confusion, to be honest. It's like, uh, you know, we started off and I was like, Hey, we're, we do residential cleaning. Um, that I'm just going to do that. Cause that's what I know. Hmm. And then afterwards I was like, Oh wait, like, you know, what, what is include, included in the Airbnb cleaning is actually very different. Hmm. Um, you know, you have to check for supplies. You have to like rep- check for damages, do the laundry. So it's kind of different. It's almost like property uh, management kind of. A bit. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And we, we thread a very fine line when people are like, Hey, can you change light bulbs? Like, no, unfortunately not. I know it takes two seconds, but like, yeah, I that, can that's for, I can for a hundred dollars a light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you do it. You just price them out of the market. It's yeah, perfect. exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, did, you, so I, did you start this business? Uh, were you kind of in, in the in the grind of it, and you were cleaning yourself, or did you kind of start the business and hire people to, and you were kind of feeding them leads to go out and do it, or how did that start for you? Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. I was not the one to clean. If you see my room right now, you'd be like, "You run a cleaning company? Are you serious?" Uh, I know. So I know now the feeling, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
uh, I immediately outsourced it. So I found a cleaner off of Craigslist and um, it's kind of funny because I was working in a corporate job. So, you know, at that, when you're starting off any entrepreneur journey, you don't really know what you're doing. Oh yeah. So the cleaner would want to get paid. I'd go to the ATM, go outside, hand cash to the cleaner as they drove by. So people from my work would see me through the windows and be like, Neil's a drug dealer. Deal like he's just work, going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I was uh, immediately started outsourcing it out of pure necessity, right? I had a yeah. job and I couldn't actually go, which I think um, sometimes I feel that when you have constraints around you, it makes you more creative to get it done. Definitely. Um, and that's kind of why I felt like we've actually advanced rather quickly because I built made this in a way which would allow me to travel, which uh, Jared, we could talk about soon because I know you mentioned that of, yeah. of traveling and you know, that's what I did for about five years. So because of that, we had to be remote from day one. So a lot of our systems and tools are made in that way. And now in a post COVID area, um, we haven't had to reinvent the wheel. It's like, Hey, we've been doing this forever. Yeah. Um, so. so you said you were working in VC, which is kind of a cool, a cool arena to work in. I mean, just, you know, you're seeing all these different startups and things like that investing. And I'm sure if you were right out of school, you're probably just in, uh, crunching the numbers, but still mm-hmm. kind of cool, uh, being in that arena. I'm also in finance. Uh, Ethan, actually Ethan is as well, but, um, you know, what can you maybe talk to us about the moment when you went from where you left, you had, you decided to leave your company. I mean, a stable company, that's a good job. I mean, VC people would die to VC. I worked at Goldman for a while and there's people that were, you know, even at Goldman, they were just like, I want to go work at a VC firm. And it's like, mm-hmm. you're at Goldman Sachs, you know, and it's just like, that was like the golden tunnel that they were yep. just going to bank their lives. And so tell me about the decision to leave that. And, uh, what, what was your earnings like? I mean, how, how big of a team did you have at that point? Yeah. And, uh, uh, you kind of nailed it, especially in the finance world. For some reason, VC is seen as like the pinnacle of where to go to. People go back to business school just so they could get into VC. So it was like a, a prestige thing, not going to lie. And even now, at least um, it sounds good if I say, hey, I used to work in VC. It almost gives you like, a, oh, cool. This guy kind of knows what he's doing. Um, he's not, the reality he's not is an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's not a complete idiot. <laughs> reality is entrepreneurship's like 10 times harder. Oh yeah. Like it's it just, it's, just, it's wild. That's, I guess the dirty secret is uh, VCs, I think get a lot of prestige, but the reality is I think business owners and the people they're investing in their jobs way harder. Um, so anyways, I, it was, it was a, a great job. I actually really liked all the people I worked with. I think I was just never really fit the finance mold. Um, you know, and I always knew from the beginning that I would quit and travel for a while. I thought I'd backpack for a year and then worst case things flopped. I'd just go back and get the same job or go work for some tech company. So I don't think it was like a, Hey, I'm done with this forever. It's more of a, I need a break from this. And I'm, I always knew I was just going to travel, but I thought it'd just be a hostel hop and backpacking for a year. And then five years later, I was still going. <laughs> yeah. And how about, for, how about for you guys? You guys are currently in finance, right? Yeah, so I'm in finance, um, more like the banking sector. Uh, I've, I'm kind of more in the. I spent some time in the investment management kind of realm, and then I've kind of more recently moved over into the uh, kind of data analytics, data science. I got a master's in data science, so uh, I've kind of worked in that now. But you know, I've got a lot of side hustles and do a lot of things on the side. Obviously, we do mm-hmm. podcasts and and a variety of other things. But yeah, so. I have some different experiences. Yeah, I uh, <clears throat> I graduated in uh, with a degree in supply chain management, and uh, from there went into uh, inventory management, forecasting, predictions, and then uh, moved to into the finance realm, more on the the sourcing side. So mm-hmm. we uh, source whatever our our parent company needs, um, whether it's physical products or uh, financial goods, whatever it may be. So, hmm. gotcha. so. Yeah. How has so you you started this business? You were able to outsource the uh, let's say the labor of people going mm-hmm. to the going to the house and, and and doing the physical act of cleaning, um, and then you just continued to. You said this was in two thousand thirteen, and then that's when just, I originally started. Yeah, yeah. So then you just continued just to kind of grow from there. I mean, how did you? How did you get your leads? Were you doing some sort of marketing, try to get these leads? And then you said you were going to, I don't know, Craigslist or something, finding cleaners, or did you hire people on and you started your business? And how did that all develop? Yeah, so I I did it about two years part-time before I quit in 2015 and went full-time. And around that point, I think we were doing around 25 or 30,000 in revenue per month. Um, So, you know, it scaled to that point. But to get there, 
like a ton of trial and error, man. Yeah. Like I just, I, you had no idea what you're doing. Right. So you're like, I guess I'll try Google AdWords. I've heard of this and you, you give it a shot and it kind of works, but you don't realize your ROI is terrible. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of learnings <laughs> um, in it. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it was really just a game of, of chicken and egg, right? You have a cleaner, you have a customer, you have more customers, you need more cleaners and it goes back and forth. And the reality is even now, eight years down the line, it's still a game of chicken and egg it's a seesaw mm-hmm. and i train our, our franchisees because we just we just started the, the franchise operations that hey it's kind of forever this game of seesaw and that's just what local services are it's not just cleaning it's not just my business it's just any local services is you have customers you have cleaners it's supply and demand and it's never really fully equal right mm-hmm. so at the beginning it was just hey get a cleaner they get booked up great go find another cleaner they get booked up and keep going from there then just a lot of scrappiness about how to get customers you try and like coding engines, thumbtack. I'm just posting on Craigslist. I'm flyering neighborhoods. I'm doing SEO. Then you kind of figure out after a while, what are the few things which really do work for you? And then you double down on that. Um, yeah. And as we grew, we started to bring on more and more cleaners. And right now in California, the cleaners are uh, independent cleaners, meaning they have their own clients, but they also get jobs through us. And with us, the way the business model works, um, two segments, one is just vacation rentals and the other is just regular residential. Regular residential, if you need a monthly, bi-weekly, weekly cleaning, you could go online on the website. There's like very pretty clean packages. You just click it and order it. You know, tech package, automatic reminders, you could reschedule. And on the back end, we have a group of cleaners that we vetted, highly, highly vetted. And we know them. We met them in person. Uh, they go and do the cleaning. And then we make the margin in between. That's that's the model, basically. Same for the vacation rental side. We automate the scheduling so we could link into their uh, calendar anytime a guest checks out. Um, and then before the next guest checks in, a cleaning has to happen. So automate all of that, match them with cleaners, manage the process. So that's kind of the way the business model works. Um, so yeah, Ethan, to your question, it really is just a chicken and egg type of thing. And I think that's how a lot of the local services are. Yeah, that's great. So really, you're kind of like a, the main bulk of your business is sourcing. I mean, really, that's what you're just sourcing leads. Um, is, is that is that correct? I mean, that mainly that's and then building systems around that and then connecting the people uh, to do that, right? Yeah. And there's like anytime there's a lot of moving parts, which are people, there's uh-huh. always things which are going to go wrong. Oh, yeah. Always, always, always. Right. Especially if you're in the middle of it. Uh, but the way I see it, and honestly, like any business, it's everything's just funnels. It sounds, it sounds so philosophical. Like life is just a funnel, but it really is yeah. right. If you think about like dating, it is a funnel. You just get the max number of leads. You push them through a process and out comes the, uh, whatever's at the end. Right. So yeah. it, in, in the same way, there's two funnels are running here. And this is how most local businesses operate. You have a funnel for customers and then the funnel for cleaners, which mm-hmm. is equally important. Yeah. You do marketing on both ends, drive them through the funnel. And then what our system does is, is match the two together. And this is all manual, right? We're, yeah, yeah. we're actually meeting with the cleaners, vetting them, getting them on board and making sure they understand how things work. And the same with the customers and then matching them. Uh, but you're totally right, Jared. Yeah. It, it, is, it is just two funnels running and is making sure that we have our operations manpower um, looking at everything. Yeah. I mean, I imagine that's you get a lot of churn with both ends of the business. Really, I mean, with some of the cleaners, I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I clean my own house, and I I know mm-hmm. that cleaning is not like it's kind of a low entry level type of position. I mean, I mean, you could. I don't know that the, there's no like certification for cleanings. I mean, anybody could just pick up a thing and say, you know, I've been cleaning my house for 20 years, and I know how to clean. I want to be a cleaner. Uh, so mm-hmm. I, I imagine with that kind of a low or end of a type of a skill set, you have a ton of churn. In fact, one time when we were growing up, we had a house cleaner, and uh, she just absolutely fell off the end. She just fell off the map. My, my, my mom thinks that she, well, we were, we sounds were, familiar. Yeah. We're one of, uh, I'm one of five, five kids. So we, there was five kids in our family. And so my mom had a house cleaner and this lady just one day, she just stopped showing up. My mom knew that she had yeah. some heart issues. So she was like, I think she might've died, but she just never answered her phone, never just totally gone. So, you know, we, we still think about her sometimes <laughs> to this day, still eating you up. You're going to go find her. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm sure you've experienced stuff like that where they just absolutely people just ghost you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it, was, it was funny you mentioned that at home with five siblings, I guarantee you guys are probably splitting up chore duties, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So when she left, yeah. it was pretty sad. <laughs> yeah. I'm <laughs> back to it. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm the same with me, me and my uh, sister. We'd split up duties. Now I'm like, I only know how to sweep the floor. I have no idea how to do dishes, but 
you know, it's part of it. <laughs> um, Jared, to your point, the churn, um, it is definitely uh, a concern. And I think it's a concern for anyone dealing with blue collar labor, candidly. Yeah. Um, I, I think the way we think about stuff and we view the world and we view jobs and things like that is kind of different depending on who you are and what your, what your situation is. Yeah. So I think in general, yeah, I think churn is a, a, a big deal for anyone who's dealing with a local services type of business for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I will say is the reason why, so there's people who try to be the Uber of cleaning services, right? That's not us. We don't want to do that. Uh, but it's companies like Handy try to be the Uber of cleaning services. This is why it doesn't work is because it is kind of a specialized field. If someone hired me to go clean a place, they'd be like, hey, this is the worst job ever. I'm going to complain. I want a refund, right? So there's a little bit more skill than just driving someone from A to B like an Uber. Yeah. So there's companies who've tried to be the Uber of cleaning services, but the reality is the quality just isn't there. Uh, I would actually consider it a little bit more of a specialized skill than okay. one might think. I feel like um, exper- therefore- experience is like the, the trainer there, uh, just having done it so many times and getting somebody who's experienced with, with cleaning I mean, that's, that's where that, that higher skill set comes in probably. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's kind of goes back to, um, in some ways, I guess we call it a creed of like what we look for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, experience is one great communication and reliability. If a cleaner has those three things, we know they're going to succeed yeah. and that oh, yeah. we could book them up with big of good business and things like that. But the reality is there's usually one aspect missing. They may be a great cleaner, um, and reliable, but their communication is terrible. Yeah. Right. So, you know, that's part of our funnel. And we have like a five step cleaner vetting process to get to that candidate who would actually qualify and we'd actually be able to work with. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is surprisingly much more of a specialized field than one might think. Do you, so do you vet only, do you look for only professional cleaners? I mean, what if someone says like, I've been cleaning my house for 30 years. I mean, like, how do you, do you're like, nah, that doesn't actually count as experience. Or do you count that as experience? uh experience no but at that point i'm looking at the attitude purely okay right yeah because uh, if someone um i'll give an example we have um a cleaner vendor who's working with us his name is jeffrey never never cleaned at all we completely took a chance on this guy um but you know he he was making youtube videos that's just what he wanted to do but he came in so enthusiastic so willing to work um and he said hey i bought my own supplies i have a, a couple of clients i'm already working with so we we're like oh let's give this guy a shot um I don't know how much money he's made with us, but his clients love him. He's very personable. Maybe he's not the most detailed cleaner, but he makes up for it just by personality. And he has a huge <laughs> book of business now. Cool. So it's just, yeah, it's just like, you know, kind of a balance. Like some clients really want personality and communication and that connection. Other clients are like, hey, I don't want to talk to the cleaner ever. Just give me someone who's in and out. Yeah. So, or a lot of times, yeah. I guess with, with Airbnbs, probably they just go into an empty house and clean it and make sure everything's good and then leave. So there's less cleaners love that too, especially yeah. cleaners don't want to talk with people. They're like, I, I don't want to deal with or people. They don't, they don't want to have the little kids just like chasing them around with the vacuum cleaner <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. It, it is funny though. Cause, um, we started in LA, right? So we're in LA, the Bay area, and uh, now we're expanding across the U S with the franchise model. But in LA, you would imagine with Airbnbs, the situations you're walking into post movie parties, like all oh, these yeah. ridiculous things where cleaners call and remember at the beginning, they're like, uh, Hey Neil, I could call the client about this directly, but there's like a bunch of needles everywhere. What do you want me to do? I'm like, all right, just don't touch anything. <laughs> just get out of there right now. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it does get pretty wild actually. It's kind of funny. Wow. So, so your business initially started out in, in California, right? And that's kind of where you have, where you've kind of built. And I know you say you're franchising across the United States. Um, h- how does that work? So let's say, you know, Jared and I are in North Carolina and we say, Hey, we want to franchise with, with, uh, the you know made this franchise then Mm -hmm. how would that would that work is it like a a a purchase into the franchise or does the parent company feed leads to us who finds cleaners or how does that process work yeah sure so the idea kind of came because um people reaching out to me and saying hey i I need help with the cleaning company i just tell them look i've already made this mistake before please just do this like i already spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on this follow this guidance. Um, so a lot of the premise of the franchise is, Hey, I've already made the mistakes. Just copy the model exactly. And yeah. this is the type of business model where I think you'd be able to lose a lot of money before you make a lot of money. Just trying to figure it out. It sounds simple, but there's simple things you would do to optimize operations. And with so many moving parts with people mm-hmm. um, that is needed. 
So with the franchise model, you summarize it perfectly. Um, there's an initial buy-in fee, and then we pretty much become partners, right? And then uh, with the, as a normal franchise model, there's a royalty involved, which is a percent of the revenue. Uh, but with that, you get um, pretty much the entire playbook, which is every mistake I've ever made, ever <laughs> systemized, put in a format, which you can be doing the uh, running the operations remotely, right? So um, it's kind of positioned as what I call a remote local franchise, where, yes, it is local. Um, but you can run it from wherever in the world you want, just kind of like I did. Yeah. You don't, you don't have to physically be there. No, no. So like when I, um, when I quit my job, I booked a one way flight to Columbia and I was traveling for about five years while building this business in Los Angeles. Um, and I think that's the beauty of where we are in this day and age is that technology has advanced so rapidly that you really don't need to be there anymore, but there's this old school mentality of, Oh, it's a local business. You have to be there locally. Uh, and you don't. In fact, sometimes it's actually better if you're not because you could find creative ways to get things done. Uh, and the cool part about local businesses, in my mind, is people are generally like two to five years behind the times. I think I read a stat where like yeah. 40% of local businesses still don't have a website as of like 2017. Um, so the reality is like, at least in terms of marketing, you just need to do what's current in marketing and you're already ahead of the competition in terms of like systems. If you run it in a remote way, which many other tech companies are already doing, Local companies aren't doing that, so they aren't reaping the advantages of that. So I think there's just so many benefits with having a remote local business model. So I'm parting that onto franchises, um, helping them with everything with the operations. We do help them get leads as well. We do certain things for them, and then we just teach them, hey, in your local market, try X, Y, and Z. And then there's this huge support system on the back. So any question they might have, it is answered for them. So it's almost like um, bowling with the rails on. That's kind of the analogy. <laughs> Gordon, yeah. like, the bumpers, right? The, the bumpers, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. So, uh, so then you help them. You help the franchise, uh, uh, the franchisee, basically do the marketing. Like this is how we th- these different strategies you can use, uh, and then so that they can build their own book of business. And really, you said that all these cleaners or independent cleaners, they're probably ten ninety nine employees, right? So they're not employees. You don't have to manage any like payroll or anything like that. It, it could just be one person just managing a, a team of cleaners. Is that right? Correct. Absolutely. And like, there's different ways to do the model, just depending honestly what state you're in. Yeah. Some, some franchisees will come to us and say, um, Hey, I want to run it with the employee model. Like it's great. Just a few operation changes you need to make. Um, mm-hmm. and that's what you need to do. The goal. Um, I think the ideal prospect is someone who understands the power of, of being remote and wants to do that. Yeah. If someone just wants to like have an office space and be localized, the model of course works. But, um, I, I think a lot of people who are attracted to it say, Hey, I can do this remotely. I could do it very leanly, uh, and I could do it like you said with the contractor model. So, uh, I guess um, a couple questions more about the franchise itself. One I wanted to ask: How many franchisees do you have at this point? Yes, we launched in late 2020, so relatively recent. Yeah, just a funny time to launch like a, a Airbnb cleaning franchise right in the middle of the pandemic where there's a travel ban. But hey, <laughs> why not? It better than never, uh, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So we uh, awarded our first franchise in Denver in late 2020, uh, and are currently just vetting a few other ones right now. So just Denver is up right now. Nice. That's, That's awesome. awesome. And well, have you, do you have like an established like intro pricing, or is it something you might you could share with us, like what your, uh, what your buy-in price? Because you, know, you, you go on the website out there, and you can see what the franchise buy-ins. You're like, oh, a Subway is this much, and a McDonald's is this much. And so, I guess it's kind of a similar mentality where you're buying you know, certain rights and, and systems in place. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that something you would be able to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the initial fee is uh, 35000 and we estimate in the first three months, you'll probably spend between like forty five to 70000 The high end is, that includes the uh, initial fee, by the way, because mm-hmm. um, it is a very lean operation. Um, you know, the high end is if you don't have a laptop yet, if you don't have a smartphone yet, yeah. you need to buy all that kind of stuff. The low end is if you have all of that. And the reality is most of the expenses are around marketing. Okay. Uh, that's basically, it's a, it's a pretty lean operation after that. And then there's royalty. Um, that is 6% of revenue and drops down to 5% right when you hit a million dollars. Oh, wow. So yeah. uh, you're looking at probably, I mean, if you're tech savvy at all, I mean, you have a computer and a phone, you're in it, you're probably looking at 40 to 50 grand to get this thing off the ground uh, within the first year. Yep. And then ongoing, you're, well, I guess it depends on how big you scale, but depending on how much you want to dump into marketing and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's, it's, um, look, I started this 
obviously cheaper than that because I did it from scratch. Yeah. But I spent two years of trial and error. Now, if you look at how much revenue we have right now, and if I could have sped that up by two years, that's so much like there's way more money. So I think a lot of it is just time collapsing is the benefit I feel of yeah. any franchise model. I'm not saying just made this, just any franchise model is hey, someone's already made those mistakes, buy their mistakes. Don't yeah. have to don't redo what don't reinvent the wheel here. Yeah. And that's a lot of what I think franchising in general is is just time collapse what you're doing. How much are you guys doing in business revenue now? I, I think I heard on another podcast ballpark, but that was a little bit older. So could you share that with us? Yeah, I can. Um, I'm all right, I'm trying to think of what I am and at. I, I can share it. I cannot share it based on the franchise model. It is a very regulated industry. Now I could share it. in 2019. I'll give you 2019 numbers. For example, we were close to 2 million in revenue. Wait, didn't you, uh, did you, well, you said you started in 2020 though, right? This was just the this was the business that pre before you started the franchise model. Okay, this yeah. is the California operations okay. that we're running right now. So uh, those numbers, um, yeah, in, in, I think we were around like one point nine ish in twenty nineteen cool. uh, for the California operations. So uh, maybe more of a maybe more of a personal question. Uh, obviously, this has been a journey for you, right? It's been a journey mm-hmm. uh, emotionally. I'm sure it was a journey physically because you did some traveling <laughs> too. Mm-hmm. Um, how has that been for how has that been for you in your personal your own personal growth and what are some key lessons that you learned in starting your own business maybe some business lessons but also some life lessons that you learned yeah great question um i think the um doing anything hard forces you to kind of um grow yourself a lot And I think that's the great part about entrepreneurship in general is you have to be the best version of yourself because your business is just a reflection of you. You'll be very hard pressed to find um, a a very successful company with an entrepreneur who's leading, who doesn't know what he's doing, who hasn't leveled himself up. Like you just, it it is so apparent of just a one-on-one correlation. If you level yourself up, all of a sudden your business is better. Like, I don't know why, but it just kind of happens. So that, that I think is the cool part about entrepreneurship and just, me diving into it. And I realized later of like, man, I've had to deal with a lot of hard stuff, dealing with personnel issues, dealing with COVID, uh, dealing with a lot of different things which come up. But at the end, it kind of just levels you up because you have to level up, right? So it lets you accelerate much faster just by going through that kind of hardship, which I liked. Uh, and, and I think that's part of any journeys you have to like, you have to appreciate the hard things because then you actually get benefits from that. But yeah, you know, people always say it's like it's the journey, it's not the destination. I'm like, yeah, actually, it's kind of true. It's kind of cheesy, but it is true. Yeah, no, 100. percent And and that was kind of led led into my next question of if if there was an entrepreneur out there who was uh, kind of in the in the grassroots movement of trying to start something new and and build their own uh, company or business, what would your specific advice be to them? I know what it meant to you, but if you had that person sitting in front of you, what would you tell them? So uh, I'll tell you a story at the beginning of when I was trying to start my business, I probably started 10 different things. And I kind of just, I felt so productive because I was like, I'm listening to this podcast. I've been learning a bunch. I'm going to subscribe to this blog. I'm listening to this course. And you feel like you're doing so much good stuff. But the reality is it's false productivity. And I kind of fell into what's called analysis paralysis, which you're just analyzing and analyzing and analyzing and don't really take action. Uh, And again, this sounds like a very generic advice as well, but it's almost like just do it. Um, And Look, you're probably going to flop and that's okay, but I guarantee you're going to advance a little bit more and you'll see what opportunities there are. Uh, the, the quote I always like is you can't steer a parked car. If it's parked and you can't do anything, you don't see opportunities. But even if you're moving, you could finally say like, okay, maybe this isn't the path I'm going down, but I could actually steer. And that's generally what happens. What if you start off with is not where you're going to end up with, but might as well just go because you're going to see what other opportunities pop up after that. Um, so it's just, Hey, even if it's the wrong direction, just move, just move. That'd be the, that'd be the advice. That's great. Very good. Very, yeah. very cool. I, I totally agree with that. You don't have to get it right. You just have to get it going. Kind of thing. What would you guys say? I, mean, I know you've had other people on the podcast, listen to tons of entrepreneurs. What is the common theme or what would you guys advise someone? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I think that, but I, you, you don't have to get, like I just said, I was saying, you don't have to get it perfect. You just got to get going. I mean, like we, we also started our podcast in the middle of our, our kind of, in October of 2020, and mm. uh, we were just like, you know what? We've been talking about this for a while. We've, uh, you know, let's stop talking. Let's just do it. And and then we came out with an episode, and we're, we were like, oh, maybe we'll do it every other week. And we're like, you know what? We're just gonna do every week. And so uh, we've been doing great. And then 
know, we're just trying different things. You know, like we're uh, we have a, a Patreon that we're uh, releasing some exclusive episodes on. We're trying that out. We're trying different things. We've, uh, you know, we've got uh, Instagram going. I, I do. We we post on Instagram every single day. We're getting TikTok. We actually Ethan's uh, our TikTok guy. He's getting TikTok going, and we're just trying a bunch of different stuff. And honestly, you know, we're exploring and. Uh, looking for folks, uh, you know, in, if, that are inspirational like yourself and like others that we've had on that are really help us uh, keep us motivated and keep us going and and give some interesting tips about different things. You know, uh, I think it's, it's been fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think I think one thing for me is kind of a, a couple things. But number one, don't be afraid to fail, which kind of goes into what you're saying. Um, and another thing is you don't have to be. And I have learned this: uh, you don't have to be an expert to to do something. Um, in Mm. fact, if you talk to any expert out there, they became an expert by doing it. And so it's, you know, for example, like the podcast stuff, we get into it and, you know, the first couple podcasts, maybe we're a little shaky. We're trying to figure out our equipment and all sorts of kind of stuff. And, and we're doing so much research and trying to figure it out. But if we would have waited until we're like, oh, Hey, I know exactly what we're going to do. I know exactly, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, this is exactly how it's going to lay out. Then then it w- w- there would have been no reason to delay, you know, some of yeah. those, some of those kinks you got to work out <clears throat> while you're doing it. And absolutely. So that, that would kind of yeah. be some of my and advice. E- Ethan, it reminded me, I was in, um, I'm in a mastermind group uh, and this specific mastermind group, we just talk about kind of mental hurdles that anyone's a part of. And I, I was in a call yesterday with them. The topic was uh, fear of rejection, why that happens. And it kind of goes into what you said regarding um, failure. Why do people, fear failure so much and how do you combat that and a lot of um you know the discussion isn't exactly to find a solution it's just more about people talking about it and you kind of come up with ideas for it and one thing which stuck out to me is that um many times if you do other things in life where you could have success it could bleed into what you're stalling and procrastinating on i mean like you don't if you're not having great success and just kind of stalling on getting your business going, you can just go. But if you're really afraid, afraid of failure, just boost yourself up in a bunch of different areas, try a bunch of different things and you get more self-confidence, whether you achieve it or not. And that'll allow you to just um, actually go forward with starting your business. So anyways, it, it just kind of made me think is like, there's some ways to combat failure. I know it's very easy just to say, oh, don't be afraid of failing, but how do you not be afraid of failing? I think the answer I came to was just do a bunch of, a bunch of other stuff and you'll see that failure is actually not that bad. Yeah, you're totally right. In fact, when we started our podcast, uh, I had my we my wife and I we had our fourth child like a month later, and then two months after that, Ethan had his fourth child. So it's been like a it's been a time. He's got big families. <laughs> yeah, we do. It's been a time where it's been super busy, lots of kids, having a newborn, waking up several times at night. So even through all that, we've been able to you know consistently come out with a podcast, and 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 so. You know, as we start getting a uh, full nights of sleep, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll be able to have more energy to really put in and and to start growing the business more. So we're we're super excited about that. Good, yeah, definitely. Love it. So, um, what's what's next for you? You know, we've we've, tra- we've talked about this business that you're growing. You're you you're kind of on the path, and you've started these these franchises. You talked about the one in Denver, and then there's some more on the on the page. Uh, what does the next five years look like for you and your business? And and maybe personally the business, and then are there any other businesses that you're interested in starting now? There's so many other businesses, but I got to put blinders on. Is the problem? <laughs> I think we all have this. I'm like, oh, this is a great idea. I'm just going to do this. Yeah. Uh, I have a I have a list uh, in my asana, which is just like business ideas and anything. Anytime I'm showering or something, and a business idea pops up, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to write this down and store it for later. <laughs> the reality is, none of them are ever going to get done, but Hey, at least it doesn't distract me. Uh-huh. I'll put it on the someday list. <laughs> uh, now, honestly, like the next five years, if I see it, we just once made this franchising and I'm, I'm pumped about it. Um, I think what I like a lot is, uh, Kenley, I, I don't want to sell hundred franchises. Like that type of thing doesn't excite me. I'd rather work with 10 to 20 highly curated people, help them change their lives. Right. If they see what I did and they're like, Oh, that sounds really great. I want to do something similar and just copy what he did that excites me the most. So just working one-on-one with individuals, helping them on their path of entrepreneurship. So honestly, I'm kind of heads down and focused on made this franchise and helping that grow and scale. Um, and then personally, so I, I was uh, just quote unquote digital nomad for about five years and, and doing that thing. And it was, it was awesome. I think you just meet the coolest people on the road. Uh, and that just opens up your mind to so many different ways of life, um, which is fantastic. So going forward, I think 
traveling like that is always going to be a large part of my life, but I'm definitely have slowed down since COVID when COVID hit, I was in Mexico and they just signed a lease. And I was like, well, great. I, <laughs> in hindsight, I should just stay there. Just like tacos and beer in the beach. Like why not? <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm sure I, I, I will probably continue a high level of travel. It won't be as, as rapidly as maybe it was during the last five years, mm-hmm. but um, that's something I would still want to continue for the next five years in through life. Maybe live somewhere else for a while. Cool. As long as, long as you have a good internet connection, right? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so, there's so many times where I'm like, sitting somewhere the internet's so bad i'm like i would just pay i would pay a thousand dollars for good internet right now just anything uh oh, yeah which is such a first world problem if you think about it yeah yeah so let's say maybe talk about a little bit your travels a little bit i mean you you're yeah you're living the tim ferris lifestyle here where you just you know, travel <laughs> around the world and work four hours a day nah i'm, I'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure you work more than that because you're an ambitious guy but uh you know you lived in you said you lived in columbia where else have you traveled to yeah, I think in the last five years, I think it was around like 30 or 35 countries I was going. Oh, wow. Um, so probably the longest stretch was probably either Thailand um, or somewhere in Europe. I spent a good amount of time in Budapest. So those would be probably the longest stints. So in the traveler community, there's actually hubs of places where people kind of congregate, places where like quality of life is high for the cost. So you end up running into a lot of other people who are working remotely. And I think that community is, in my opinion, the coolest part about travel. So a lot of us, like I'd see them in Budapest and I'd see them in Thailand and be like, oh, hey, you're here too. Like that's 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 cool. And it just ends up being kind of a small community. Uh, so I, I would gravitate to a lot of the nomad hubs around the world. Uh, and it's awesome. You just kind of plugged into this network of people who all have kind of the same mentality. Um, yeah, it, and that that's kind of why one year, of what should have been backpacking became five years. It's just, yeah, it kind of keeps going. Do you speak any of the languages? Uh, I speak Spanish and Gujarati, which is, uh, I'm Indian. So okay. my, my parents' mother tongue. Oh, nice. I was going to yeah. say, speaking Spanish is probably, you know, in Cal- Ethan and I both speak Spanish, uh, knowing Spanish and interviewing cleaners and stuff. I mean, that's probably super helpful. <laughs> It, it's funny. It's more like endearing than anything because they know that I'm not fluent fluent Spanish. So oh, yeah. I speak to them, and they're like, "Oh, he's trying very hard." <laughs> so it is. It, it does def- work. It's an icebreaker for sure. And, and oh, you want to sure. open any, you know, want to bring down the barriers on any uh, person that speaks Spanish. You, you speak Spanish to them, or you know, then there's words that it, that I've forgotten and stuff like that. And and but you uh, you ask them, oh, "What is this word again?" And people are so willing to be, not just mm-hmm. Spanish, with any other language, I'm sure they'd be like, they're just willing to help you and talk to you and it just opens it up. For sales, it, Absolutely. Works, for sales, it works out pretty good. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's funny because I, um, uh, I I took Spanish through grade school and stuff. So even though I'm not really fluent, at least I think my accent's pretty good. Uh-huh. The problem with that is you speak with someone, they hear your accent, they're like, oh, he actually knows what he's talking about. And the reality is I'm not that good. <laughs> so they're like, oh, you know, then just rattle off at 100 miles an hour. Yeah, and then I'm just like I kind of nod, and do that thing. <laughs> well, Ethan and I both spent. We actually lived abroad for a while too. We we both served um, kind of like religious missions. I was in Mexico, Central Mexico, for two years, uh, and then oh, Ethan, where at? I was in Aguascalientes, San Luis Potosí, and um, Guad- Guanajuato. So kind of cool. Central Central Mexico. Guanajuato is the only place that I think anyone would ever visit tourist wise because it's the Cuna de la Independencia, as they would say, or the the heart or the the cocoon of the independence. I think that's what it means. <laughs> uh, I, I, sometimes I don't even know. I learned, I learned these words in Spanish. And I don't even know what the English translation is. <laughs> <laughs> like actually a funny story. I came back, I learned, uh, so in Mexico, I learned there was tons of avocados, right? So I was like, mm. and, and in Spanish it's aguacate. And mm. I'm like, growing up, we never had avocados at home. I don't know what no. my parents, I don't know what what it was, but they never had avocados, mm-hmm. and so I didn't even know what it was called in English. And I was, just, and I got back, and they're like, "Well, what do you, what kind of food do you miss?" I'm like, "I want aguacates." It's like I didn't know how to <laughs> say that, and also cilantro. I was like, "I want cilantro." I was like, "How do you say that in English?" And they're like, "Oh, cilantro." I was cilantro. Like, yeah, that. I want that. It's got to Americanize it. Yeah. I uh, so I I lived in uh, South America in Chile, northern Chile for for two years. Um. And yeah, it's it's just interesting. It's it's interesting how that how uh, different regions speak differently because the the Spanish word for avocado is aguacate, but in Chile they they say palta, and so it's just like oh wow yeah it's it's just a different a different word for the same for the same word. But yeah, it's just yeah. interesting. Chile is also a very hard place to learn Spanish. Yeah, it is. They 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 have a very different cadence and kind of 
rhythm to to what they how they speak. But yep. So you ever like you lived abroad to be for five years? That's a long time. I mean, have you ever run into a situation where like it, you feel like you're in danger, or you feel like you know you're gonna need like your dad to come and pull like a Liam Neeson to come get you out of a situation <laughs> or something like that? You know. <laughs> You know what's funny is the only sketchy run-ins I've had have only been with police. Huh. It's never with locals. Like there's been a couple of times with locals, but that was in Europe. But for all like the quote unquote sketchy countries I've been to in South America, like I've never had troubles there. Uh, the couple of times I had at I think one time it was in South Africa. Um, I just I small story. I got out of like an Uber and a cop came up, frisked me down, was trying to like pretty much get money out of me by saying, "Hey, you have drugs." Um, you know, one one of those things where you're like, okay, yeah, just what is the fine? Just tell me <laughs> yeah, how, how much, much money do you want? Yeah, yeah, let's get out of here. So it's I I got I think pretty lucky um, that I have not had any situations knock on wood. Um, it's it is funny because so uh, in South America, I am a little bit darker skin. So many times if people see me, they'll just say, oh, maybe he's just like a dark Colombian guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one time I was walking with my friend um, Sean who came to visit me, who's a white guy. And we got stopped by the cops way more times than when I was just there. It's like, geez, this yeah, man, white guys are rich. You didn't know that? <laughs> Gringos and money. Yeah, gringo. Yeah. Have yeah. you guys had any run-ins in your two years? Tell them about your story when you got stopped by the cops on your mission. When uh, when oh. you were like, oh, you played dumb. Yeah. You're like, oh no, yeah, I'm so, Espanol. <laughs> so I uh, I was driving right, and um, I was driving. We were actually going to the airport to pick some people up, and we were late. And so I was driving kind of fast and I came up over this hill and I had been there for almost two years and I spoke Spanish fluently mm. um, and uh, came up over this hill and there was this traffic stop and basically it was like a speed trap and I was going way too fast. And um, so the this cop waved us down, he pulled us off to the side of the road and it was me and actually a Chilean guy uh, in the car and... Um, I was driving, so the cop came over to the window, and he started talking to me in, in Spanish. Obviously, I knew exactly what he was saying, and he was saying, you know, you're going way too fast. Did you know how fast you're going? And he was pretty upset, and I figured I could, I figured I had a couple different directions I could go, and the direction that I chose was the dumb American, <laughs> and so I just started, I started butchering Spanish. I mean, like, just, bu- like, conjugating verbs completely wrong, and just, like, the putting on the, the thickest American act, the gringo accent that I could and like pointing at stuff and everything. And, and he was trying to talk to me and the guy that I was with was, was trying not to laugh as hard as he could. Uh. He, he like turned his head to the other side of the window and like couldn't even. And finally this cop, after like five minutes of trying to explain to me that I was going too fast or whatever, he kept pointing at the speedometer, you know, you were going this fast. Yeah. And, so, and I was like, Oh, uh, lo siento, lo siento. Like, I'm sorry. And, and, um, <laughs> And so we kind of went back and forth for a couple minutes and and then finally he just gave up and he was just like he was like don't go over this number and he like pointed and he said no don't go more so, than this number and I was just like oh okay yo yeah you know, yeah see 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 and, and, and he just he let me go and I was just like no ticket yeah, nothing no ticket yeah. and then the funniest part of that story is I had another American friend that was down there he got pulled over like 2 weeks later and I had told him the story. He tried the same thing, and the cop wasn't having any of it. Mm. I mean, she made him get out of the car and all this sort of kind of stuff. And finally, after like 10 minutes going back and forth, he just broke down and started speaking perfect Spanish to her. <laughs> oh, jeez. And, and, and he got some big ticket, like you know, $300 oh. ticket or something like that. For <laughs> And it was just, it was funny. But, <laughs> oh, man. So uh, that's funny. Yeah. That would, that's, it sounds like you've been all over the world. Uh, what's been your favorite place to visit? Oh, that's tough. Um, Ethan, you, I don't know if you went to, did you get the South Chile when you were there? Patagonia is one of my favorite spots. Yeah, I, I never I went asking. that far South. Yeah. Farthest I went was Santiago. Gotcha. I'm not, I don't even like hiking. Like I normally hate hiking, but in Patagonia, it's just every day you're outside and like, this looks like the matrix. Not, none of these colors should coexist with each other. So you're just outside all the whole time. So a ton of hiking in Patagonia. And I think to actually live in probably either um, North Thailand, there's a town called Chiang Mai where a lot of nomads live. So there's a great community there. Um, or probably like Lisbon, I think would have been my most livable places. Hmm. 
That's awesome. So, so what brought yeah. you back to? Are you do your parents live in California? Is that what brought you back to California? Yeah, f- family's back in Col- California. So when the world broke in March 2020, decided whether I should post up and stay in Mexico or go back, and I decided to go back, um, which is which is good. I mean, it's actually been kind of very nice being back home, and I think a lot of people in that community um, kind of had to reckon with, hey, you have to go back to your home countries. What are you going to do now? Now, now you got to face real life. Yeah. in some ways, right? Something you could keep going down the nomad path for a long time, travel, 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 and it kind of never ends. So it was kind of a nice forced stop for a lot of people, myself included saying, okay, what do I actually want the next five years to look like? So, so definitely a blessing. Hey guys, just wanted to take a quick break and say thank you for listening today and invite you to support us on Patreon. As a loyalist supporter, you get access to two additional episodes per month, which are not released publicly. You can find the link to our Patreon page in the episode description. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, I guess, like I said, we got, we both have big families. Do you ever see anybody with families doing this or is it mostly just single individuals? Um, Mostly single individuals or couples, Uh but I do, I do know that there is a community of people who are families who are doing it. I just think I'm not interacting with them normally. Yeah. <laughs> but even in a, like our entrepreneur group, there's some people who come with their families to like the conferences around the world. And they'll just be like, yeah, we're just going to travel for two months. Uh, and I know they have their own groups, which are geared towards this. So definitely people with families, I'd say the age of the kids probably dictates things a lot. Uh, I actually looked into that quite a bit. Cause at some point I would like kids and I'm like, okay, can I, can I actually do this? Like, yeah. is it, you know, cause like for where we grew up, it's not normal to do that. Yeah. Right. Like we're just not in that community. So um, I didn't even know if that was possible, but I think there's just a large community of people who do yeah. that. I, I've known a couple of people, uh, you know, one guy was a lawyer and, and another guy did, did a couple of different things that they were just like, I can do all this virtual. So basically they just bought like a, a big RV and put their, you know, four or five kids in this RV. And then they just said, we're going to take the next, you know, sold their house or whatever. And said we're going to take the next year and just drive around the country. They just wow. hook up like a satellite, uh, internet thing to their RV and, you know, a couple thousand dollars and you're, you're on your way. It's like, we, I can work from anywhere as long as I have my phone. Ethan, phone Ethan would internet. you do that RV with your five kids? Um, <laughs> I would. Jared shaking his head. Absolutely right right now, with the amount of kids, sometimes I, I wish my house was like five thousand square feet bigger, yeah. so that they could <laughs> be. I could put one at the opposite end of the house, the other at the opposite end of the house, and it's just like, yeah, there's have, not a, have a wing for each child. That'd be nice. It's like here, yeah. take this tent and go hundred yards that way and camp for the night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, and the one thing too is, as kids get older, I think kids sometimes thrive off of uh, stability. And when kids, mm. you have kids going to school and everything else, then uh, you know it can potentially complicate things. But it is an interesting topic of like, what is the ideal age for that? Because there there is some large benefits of having kids experience other cultures, other countries, dealing with change in some ways. Yeah. But to your point, Ethan, there I think there's a larger benefit of just stability. And I'm I'm very curious, and I'm sure people have already analyzed this. What is the age you should be traveling with kids, and what is the age where it's probably best to have stability? Yeah. I'm not really sure what that is, but that'd be an interesting question. What do your uh, What do your parents think about your your shenanigans around the world? Do they Do <laughs> they think it's cool that you do this, or is you like you do you worry your mom's sick that you're out in, uh, in all these different countries? You know, yeah, I'm sure she was worried during COVID. <laughs> Oh yeah. I mean, now that I'm actually doing okay, they're like, yeah, okay, that's good. You did that. And I'm proud of it. But of course at the time, like my parents are immigrants, right? So they came to this country and a lot of people, a lot of immigrant families, they just want their kids to have like, have a nice stable career, like safety because they never had that. Right. Um, So of course I'm quitting this prestigious VC job to start a cleaning company and go around the world. They're like, okay, what, like, what are you doing, dude? Are you having like a quarter life crisis? What's going on? (laughs) Yeah. Um, So the beginning, they're very apprehensive, but they're also, um, they never said no to me for anything. So they just, I think internally were very scared. And then the fact that it all kind of worked out that made this is growing, it's doing well. I'm happy with, with my lifestyle. They became more comforted by it too. That being said, I'm sure they're stoked that I'm back right now, and I'm yeah. happy to be around them too. Very cool. So, one of the yeah. last uh, business questions that I wanted to ask, I know that, uh, and, and we've listened to a couple of different podcasts you've been on. You've been on several different podcasts, um, you know, talking about business and entrepreneurship and, and and different things. How has speaking with with all these different people like us and different people on podcasts? How has that uh, helped you build your your own personal brand? That's a great question. And I've not been asked that before. Um, I, 
I, I was thinking about this recently because I think the more you are forced to talk about yourself, the more the story kind of solidifies. And like in your head is just the jumble. Like you know the stories, you know loosely what causes what. But for example, speaking with you, uh, you guys, and even asking questions of like, what do your parents think about this? Or like, how did you end up making this decision? It forces you to think about it almost in a way like I'm journaling, right? And coming to a, a consensus on how it is. Yeah. So I think it's more of solidified uh, my story. It made me analyze why, why I made certain decisions more than others, um, which, is fan- which is great. I guess in some ways you could say it solidified my story, but I just don't know if story seems more of like, hey, there's a promotional story and that's what I'm solidified. But it's more just, I think it made me uh, a little bit more aware of myself. And I think that's really cool. That's awesome. That's a great answer. Uh, well, you know, kind of towards the end of our, our podcast here, we always ask our guests uh, w- to share a little bit of their personal creed with us, which can be a quote or something that is, maybe mentors told you once or something that you've learned mm. uh, that maybe you could pass on to those who are uh, also trying to I- improve their lives and, and build their own personal creeds. Uh, so we would love to hear that from you. Yeah. And um, one of them, which is very top of mind for me right now is for some reason, I've been all the military books right now. And a lot of what they always say is just embracing the suck. Like if it sucks, that's good. Actually embrace it. Don't shy away from it. Um, you don't have to like it. You just embrace that it's there. And um, with that, actually putting that into action is if, if a sucky time happens, just embrace and say, Hey, I'm going to learn from this, but also putting yourself in situations would suck um, to let that muscle grow. Um, an example is like last weekend, I went to Salt Lake with a group of entrepreneur friends uh, to get kidnapped. So we did this kidnap experience where uh, military guys were trained us for a couple of days on how to like get out of handcuffs, how to pick locks, how to escape. Uh, then on one day you actually get kidnapped. Uh, you have to escape as you're going around the city, they're like hunting you like bounty hunters are coming after you, you have to like wear disguises. It is ridiculous. That's absolutely fun. ridiculous. <laughs> no, it was great. It was like the most fun. It's so hard though. Right. Cause they're like, even during the kidnap part, we agreed to this, which is crazy. They'll stun gun you. Oh really? Agreed to the waterboarding situation. Like you get waterboarded just... too. Mm-hmm. Damn. I lasted 10 seconds. Like I was, I was signed the waiver. You just signed the waiver. They're not going to kill you. <laughs> Where's the golden eye satellite? You know, like pour a bucket of a five gallon bucket. Yeah. Like, ah! <laughs> um yeah but like all of us were doing it for the same reason of just like we know it sucks Uh but it ends up being fun in hindsight and so i think just just the mantra creed of embracing the suck could lead to a lot of good ways of shaping your mentality that's cool yeah i I totally agree with that also i have one more question about the 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 kidnapping thing Uh, yeah did, did they give you like a like a um like a BB gun side sidearm to to that you can have to fight back or anything. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Or maybe, or maybe a better that. question: Did they give you a safe word? Yeah, I'm sure they yeah. do. Right? They did. They did. Just in case. Yeah. Uh, it ended up being kind of funny because like all of us were in the room, and um, one of the guys in my group, it's kind of like that scene in Forty Year Old Virgin where they're like ripping his hair off and he's just yelling off different words yeah. it was like that so it completely dissipated any tension because it was so hilarious <laughs> uh and then afterwards like what you have to do is you have to stash um a disguise somewhere in the city so i was i found my disguise and put on a, a construction costume uh-huh. which is also ridiculous if you're thinking about it so it just it, the experience was actually kind of fun where i was just walking around and you have to do these crazy tasks and i was dressed as a construction worker um <laughs> like it's a big adult version of tag is kind of what it felt like that sounds fun man i would love to do yeah. that that'd yeah. be such a fun thing to do well have, uh, you, have you ever seen the movie the game with michael Douglas? yes yeah. yeah that's yep. like what it is <laughs> it, was, it was like that definitely <laughs> like that uh yeah i'll let you guys know next time we do something like that but um it, it was fun it was like one of those very memorable things where you're like why am i doing this then afterwards you're like oh this is great this this is why i'm doing it yeah <laughs> Well, I, you know, going back to your, your creed of embrace the suck, I, I really like that, that, you know, there's things that are difficult and those difficult things, if you just embrace it, you adapt and overcome, then you will be stronger on the other end. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's great. So, uh, Neil, where can, um, where can the listeners find you if they want to, uh, hear more about your podcast or the podcast you you've been on or, or your franchise business, where can they find you? Yeah, sure. So my company website's made this franchise, M A I D T H I S franchise.com. Uh, you could also go to neilparek.co, uh, N E E L P A R E K H.co. 
Um, it is funny because there's there's another Neil Perek on the internet who's like a doctor who kind of looks like me in Cleveland, and I end up getting like all of his emails, and he gets all of my emails, and we're <laughs> always just like, I don't know how to contact the guy, right? Because I just get his emails. Uh, yeah. But it's funny. So I'm not that I'm not the doctor Neil. I'm, <laughs> I'm the cleaning Neil. Cool. Uh, and do you are you on Instagram or anything like that? Sharing experiences of your traveling abroad. Do you take pictures abroad and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I'm not. I'm not the biggest social media guy. I should get on okay. it more. But of course, anyone who hears this and wants to add me, feel free. Uh, Neil underscore BP. I will definitely add you if you came from this podcast. Cool. Awesome. Well, awesome. We'll we'll definitely follow you, Neil. Yes. <laughs> and, Likewise. Uh, for, for those out there, you know, you can follow us at a dot dot creed, and uh, you know, we uh, really appreciate you joining us today, Neil. This has been awesome. It's great talking to you just about business, life, all this kind of stuff, and. Uh, it's really fun guys thank, thank you, you so for having much. me yeah no problem let's uh let's build that creed together <laughs> <laughs>